Hello, and welcome to today's Collective Impact Forum Virtual Coffee. I'm Sherry Brady, Associate Director of Strategic Partnerships at the Aspen Forum for Community Solutions, and we are delighted to have you with us today. Thanks for joining us. Before we begin today's virtual coffee and introduce today's guest, I want to take a couple minutes to give you some orientation and housekeeping items so you're aware of what's happening. Today's call will run for 60 minutes. Feel free to grab a cup of coffee or tea and sit down as we chat. The virtual coffee series is really set up to be a casual learning experience and um, to be a casual learning experience where we hear from practitioners in the field about their work. We will spend um, the first half, about the first half of the call, having a discussion between Daisy, our guest, and I, and then we will open it up to questions from you all. Until then, you're in listen-only mode. Um, you can put your questions in the question box in the lower right-hand corner of your screen. We will sort through them and try to get as many as time allows. Additionally, the session is being recorded and we will continue, we will make that recording available in the next day or so. An email will be sent to the email you use to sign up for this call um, to tell you when it's available in the Collective Impact Library. Additionally, for handouts, you can grab the handouts that we'll be having. You can download them. There's a, in the, in the menu on the side of your screen, there's a handout tab and it will have the PDF of this presentation. So you can also download that to keep. Next slide. Um, if you're having any technical difficulties, you can ask for assistance in the question button, or you can send an email straight to info at collectiveimpact.org. Also, a um, reminder to send your questions using the, the chat box on the side and, um, and share this conversation on Twitter using the hashtags that you see there. Next slide. During this virtual coffee series this summer, we will talk to a variety of Collective Impact initiatives who participated in a recent research study on the approach to collective impact. The research study, when collective impact has an impact, was commissioned by the Collective Impact Forum and conducted by a joint research team from ORS Impact and the Spark Policy Institute. The study looks at the primary research question of to what extent and under what conditions does the collective impact approach contribute to the systems and to systems and population change? The full report can be downloaded at collectiveimpact.org. Next slide. Um, to explore these questions, the research team studied 25 sites, including for Mesa Boyle Heights, which is featured in today's conversation, and generated a rich set of findings that we hope will be useful for the field of collective impact practitioners, community members, funders, researchers, and evaluators. In addition to the written report, we did a webinar on the results from this report that you can download also from the resource library on the Collective Impact Forum. It features the study team from ORS and Spark Policy. Over this summer, we will be diving, excuse me, diving into different topics that arose from the study, including gathering and sharing data, advancing equity practices, and sustaining momentum over the long term. Next slide. Today, I'm delighted to have with us Daisy Hernandez, who is the director of Promesa Boyle Heights that I mentioned was included, um, was one of the 25 sites that participated in the study. And today we're going to be discussing their experience centering equity within their collective impact work. Sorry, my camera is doing a little bit of a thing. Let me make that better for you. Um, Daisy Hernandez, as I said, is the director for Promesa Boyle Heights, a passionate collaborative of adult residents, youth, schools, and allies working together to realize a shared vision for community change. Their work builds on a strong legacy of community organizing in Boyle Heights and is the result of an intensive planning process that brought together more than 4,000 residents to develop a shared vision and a plan for collective action. Prior to, to joining PROMESA, Daisy served as the Director of Advocacy and Organizing for the New York Immigration Coalition, where she worked alongside multi-ethnic grassroots organizations to push legislation and increase funding to expand opportunities and access for immigrant families and communities of color. Welcome and thank you for joining us today, Daisy. Thank you. I'm glad to be part of the conversation and look forward to our dialogue. Great. Um, and so while we get started, why don't you tell us a bit about the mission of Permissible Boyle Heights and how did you get started? Sure. Thanks, Sherry, again. Um, so very briefly, Promesa Boyle Heights uh, works to bring together, as you mentioned, adult residents, youth, organizations, schools, and institutions in our community to realize a shared vision. So we were fortunate that in 2010, we received a planning grant from the Department of Education 
that allowed us to leverage some of the recent successes that organizations in the community had just won. In particular, uh, there had been a long fight to build new schools in our community. Roosevelt High School, prior to that, was the most overcrowded high school in the nation. So wanting to leverage those recent wins, um, the collaborative was formed, and a planning process that engaged uh, multiple stakeholders uh, happened to ensure that uh, we had a shared vision uh, connected to concrete outcome goals. So really our mission is to ensure that every single child in our community from the time that they're born through the time that they graduate college and into successful careers are connected to the support that they need in the home, in the school, and in the community. Great. Um, can you tell me a little bit more about the goals and how you sort of measure the impact of, in progress of your work? Yeah. Yeah, so as I mentioned, uh, we have a very ambitious vision, right, of supporting all children from cradle all the way through college and career. Uh, so mm -hmm. in order to do that, we realized early on that we needed to make sure that residents, those most impacted by the issues, were at the forefront of identifying the problems and developing the solutions. So both, so as part of developing the solutions, we also looked at key indicators in our community. Uh, basically uh, being able to move the needle on key areas to achieve that success. So for us, we have a set of academic uh, outcome goals and wellness outcome goals that include things like increasing graduation rates, increasing college uh, application rates, college completion rates, and then the sub-indicators that fall under that, like attendance, uh, social emotional connectedness for students. Um, and then at the community level, we have a set of indicators population-wide indicators, wanting to improve mm -hmm. safety, economic development, access to affordable housing, and overall the leadership of the community. So there's, there were also very concrete uh, policy wins that were identified as part of that planning process. Um, so in summary, our work is meaning to impact three levels. We're working to realize change at the individual level. Uh, for mm -hmm. example, like, uh, leadership development for uh, parents through academic services for students. We're also wanting mm -hmm. to realize change at the whole school level. We're currently working with three schools in our community, a middle school and two high schools. And the goal there is to ensure that all students are connected to the support that they need to um, succeed academically and, um, and holistically. And then the third uh, area is really ensuring that as a community resident, are at the forefront of that community transformation in both the governance structure of PROMESA as well as identifying and driving campaigns to address some of the root causes of the issues that are impacting our community. Great. Um, I just wanted to remind you that if there are some slides that you wanted to show us as you were talking about that, we, should, we have to let Robert know to, to, we just, to move them. I so. totally <laughs> I forgot about that. Yeah, maybe we can go to the next slide. So we can please. So these are some pictures that highlight some of the uh, landmarks in our community. As I mentioned earlier, there were there are a lot of needs in our community, but our community is also a very vibrant community. It's a very tight-knit community with a lot of uh, cultural and historic pride. So those are some of the images to give uh, everybody present a sense of um, the Bow Heights community, which is a community in the east side of Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. So Great. the next slide. The next slide is a summary of our planning phase. So I mentioned earlier that uh, through a federal grant from the Department of Education in 2010, we were able to engage over 4,000 residents in um, identifying the core issues in our community. And then through a governance structure, uh, which for us includes a general assembly made up of residents, organizations, mm -hmm. and institutions, uh, really went through this very comprehensive planning process to vote on um, the key solution areas and the outcome goals. So out of that came our comprehensive uh, community plan and the shared vision. And then in 2011, um, initially the goal was that the federal government would support the implementation of this grant. We did not receive the a Promised Neighborhood Implementation Grant, but in 2011 mm -hmm. our city decided to move forward anyway uh, with the passion, commitment, and the creativity that had been leveraged during that planning. So the next slide. Thank you. Uh, 
Uh, so again, this is a quick summary of what I've already shared. So our vision has three core components. One, ensuring that um, all children from the time that they're born through the time that they graduate college and enter successful careers are supported uh, in their homes, in the community, and in their schools. We also want to see a thriving uh, community. So there's a set of solution areas, as I mentioned earlier, that address wellness needs in our community. Stable housing, healthy environments, safe public spaces, and economic development. Uh, next slide. And that we're working to create change at three levels, uh, with individuals and families, with the whole mm -hmm. school, the schools that we're working with and the community, and at the system and policy level, because we see uh, change, the change that we're going to need in our community is going to require all of these three levels of change coming together uh, to have a tilting point in the outcomes and uh, the living conditions that our residents uh, deserve. Great. Um, so I do want to ask you a little bit more about sort of how you work together in these three in these three um, systems. The question I also have for you is. Um, Sorry, for some reason my camera stopped working. But um, was how do you define equity and community within your work? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So for us, um, we see equity as first and foremost acknowledging that many of the issues that are uh, impacting our community, issues of poverty, lack of jobs, uh, poor education outcomes, uh, lack of access to affordable and healthy housing, has roots that are connected to policies and broader systems so that at the same time that we work to support individual families and students, that we also need to be uh, changing and addressing uh, those root causes of the issues. Uh, so equity means ensuring that um, there's a sense of social justice and fairness in access to resources, uh, in access to um, to dignify jobs and access to education. That's great. And so with community, is it is it just sort of the, um, how do you describe your community or what is considered sort of the community that you're focused on? I know, is it just Boyle Heights? Is it surrounding areas? Is it others? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so our work is focused on the Boyle Heights community. So it's a very uh, targeted geographic area um, that we, are focusing our transformation efforts on. And we also see community uh, as the bringing together of all the necessary stakeholders needed to create change. So for us, again, at the forefront, that being uh, adult residents and youth, as well as educators, uh, community organizations, and those civic leaders in our community. Um, so our collective impact model really uh, aims to leverage uh, the power of all of those individuals that make up our community. That's great. Um, so let's talk a little bit about how you sort of target these root causes of inequity on the, the multiple levels. You talked about individual, community, and systems level. Can you talk a little bit about how you work through this multi-level approach, you know, how they work together and leverage each other? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so an example is that at the individual level, as I mentioned, there's a set of uh, strategies along the continuum, uh, but one way that we keep equity front and center is by ensuring that as we are uh, beginning to plan our efforts, for example, in our schools, we're implementing a community school approach. And as part of that, we have academic teams and wellness teams that meet regularly to look at data and to um, identify school-wide and individual interventions. So our role for our community school coordinators that is really important is that in addition to looking at the change that we're having in, let's say, graduation rates or college going rates, that we take it a step farther and really desegregate the data to see where there's the biggest opportunity gap. Which are the subpopulations of students that uh, where progress is going lower or progress might not be happening or where we might actually be seeing uh, a slide in outcomes. Uh, so an example of that, is that in our community, when we began our school transformation work, we were mm -hmm. at about 42% graduation rate for our two high schools. We are currently have been able to increase that graduation rate to 82%. And we're Great. tremendously proud Great. of that. It's tons of people's work, teachers, school administrators, parents, youth. So we're tremendously proud of that work. 
but at the same time, when we look deeper at the data, we see that there are certain populations of students, like special education students or English language learners, who continue to lag behind uh, in graduation rates. So for the last six years, when we look at graduation rates for English learners, um, there's still a 30% difference in the graduation rates for English learners as compared to non-English learners. So that, for us, prompted conversations um, at multiple levels with school partners, with parents, and school administrators around um, assessing what needed to happen to ensure that we were um, supporting those students as well. Great. Um I have a slightly different question that I wanted to ask you to expand on a little bit. You talked about the general assembly that you put together, and that was, I'm assuming, your stakeholders and a part of in the community members. Um, is that still in place as sort of your governing body? And what is who who's on that? And how do you and how do they participate in the governance? And mm -hmm. um, what does that makeup look like? Yes. Mm -hmm. so our general assembly um, played a very active role in the uh, early planning phase in identifying mm -hmm. the solution. So they met meeting after meeting and voted on the final uh, vision for our community, um, the outcome goals, and the strategies. Their role now that we're in, in implementation is still the body that approves any major changes to the vision, uh, to the issue areas, to the strategies, and to the outcomes. So we've now had to go four times to the General Assembly to discuss possible changes to those um, to, to those big areas. And the General Assembly is made up of residents, uh, organizational representatives, um, and school administrators. It's a group of about 70 residents that meet quarterly. Um, mm -hmm. And they're not making decisions about those areas. There's updates about the progress of the work and then planning for implementation of the work. We also Great. have a hearing that meets much more regularly and it's a subset of this General Assembly. It's a smaller group, a group of about 25 folks who are tasked with much more in-depth um, support of the implementation of the community plan that we developed. That's great. And while we're on the topic of governance and structure, can I ask a little bit about sort of the backbone, how the backbone organization is staffed and what the role of that staff is? Yes. <laughs> so early on, uh, the collaborative decided that Proyecto Pastoral an organization with deep roots in the community uh, would become the backbone organization. So as part of that, uh, Proyecto has been uh, supporting and playing a leadership role within the collaborative. Uh, so PROMESA has now 14 staff, and many of mm -hmm. the roles staff are either organizers, uh, coordinators, uh, but in reality, it's a lot of meeting facilitation, a lot of <laughs> building, and uh, ongoing assessment of the impact of our work. Great. Um, so one of the questions, sorry, that just came through um, is a question about, um, this goes back to the to the General Assembly and thinking about how do you, um, what are the strategies for engaging sort of speakers of different languages and other ways of communicating um, in the General Assembly so that you can sort of are assured that your stakeholders have equal access and have agency to really make sure that their information, they're really being able to participate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that was, I think what was really helpful in our initiative is that from the very beginning, um, there was a, a vision for how we wanted residents to be engaged. And we knew that we wanted to um, elevate the role of residents as decision makers. So as part of that, there were certain foundational things that needed to be in place from the most mm -hmm. basic of ensuring that we have interpretation at all of our meetings or all the materials are translated, uh, child care and food, uh, to also creating spaces to build our leadership. So we have leadership academies that happen throughout the year where new residents that are joining the initiative have an opportunity to uh, be caught up to uh, what we're trying to do as a community, and then also build uh, core leadership skills that are going to be needed for them to play an effective role in both uh, moving the collaborative forward, as well as in some of the system level work um, that, as I mentioned very briefly earlier, we also have campaigns that aim to impact broader systems, and those campaigns are identified and led by residents. So in order to do that, there's certain capacity that needs to be built 
uh, from the very beginning. Uh, so I would say, yes, mm-hmm. for us, it's essential and important that we have those basic um, needs addressed. But because we also had a vision that um, elevated the role of residents, it required us for us to think early on about what are the additional needs, what are the leadership capacity needs, um, that we're going to need to have in place to support resident leadership. Uh, another important one is the staffing. So most of our staff um, are either from the community or have backgrounds that are very similar to the ones uh, in our community so that residents are able to communicate and connect and build relationships uh, with our staff because um, our work, we say, it's all relationships, relationships, relationships. <laughs> That's great. And um, this sounds like there could be some challenging, there's going to be some challenges in that. So can you talk a little bit about sort of what have you found to be the most challenging um, aspects of this work as you were sort of addressing these inequities and really supporting community members to stay involved, to really be able to have agency and participate fully in the process? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I would say that um, one of the biggest ones that we've seen was kind of calibrating our capacity. So mm. that in that when we ended the planning mm. phase, there was a ton of momentum and almost a sense of um, power in saying, even though we didn't get a federal grant, we're implementing and we're going to do this and we're going to do that and we're going to do this, uh, but with very limited capacity. And I felt like it, for many years, we kind of kept at that pace of uh, mm-hmm. asking staff, asking our partners, asking residents to give 120%. So I think we're in a moment right now of reflection and wanting to build sustainability long-term. So it means reassessing um, how we build more capacity, how we slow down the work, and uh, perhaps even um, scale down some of the initiatives that, uh, that we launched. So I would say that's one of the big challenges Uh, And then the other one just being the political climate that we're in, that Mm. at the same time, wanting to scale and focus our work, new needs that emerge in our community that our residents are asking us to respond to, and they're wanting to respond to, and we need to respond to. Um, For example, last year, we had to launch a huge immigration pilot uh, to, one, connect residents with Know Your Rights information, build a network of lawyers to support our community, and then launch our uh, immigrant rights campaign so that we were also uh, pushing for those policy, uh, national level policy changes uh, that we need to address the, the root issues. So I would say capacity mm-hmm. and the political mm-hmm. That's good. Um, one of the things I'd like to ask you about that I'm wondering if it's a challenge, are there, you know, partnerships? I'm assuming partners have to be a big part of this as a collective movement, as collective action. And so as there have been times, and you guys are pretty steeped in thinking about equity and social justice in your framework. Has there been times when you've had to deal with, a, you know, potentially have a partner who is not quite as steeped into this, into equity and social justice as a center and as a core, but you needed to, you know, for some reason they needed to be a part of the coalition or part of the movement that was happening and sort of how do you deal with that and what do you think about as you approach someone for partners, you know, another organization for partnership? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think um, there's two parts to that. So one is that I think the advantage of us having a framework that is looking to impact change at those three levels, the individual, the school, and the community, uh, that gives enough flexibility and space for different partners, assuming that they align to the vision, assume, assuming that they align to the values of resident leadership, uh, to play a role. So, for example, we wouldn't ask our after-school service providers or our, our academic providers to really engage in mobilizing or collecting petitions because we know that's, you know, outside of the scope, but we are intentional about uh, making sure that they're aware of the campaigns that residents are leading uh, so that they can play support roles in a way that makes sense for them. Um, so I think that we found really helpful because then there's different pieces of the puzzle together. Uh, mm-hmm. But then there's also been challenges, and I would say mainly with some of our institutional leaders and partners, and really having to uh, do a lot of uh, education, lots of meetings to ensure that they really, that they understood 
um, the community vision and the changes that the community were um, advocating for. And sometimes uh, in order to do that, to get that attention, it required us building, you know, enough political muscle or using different tactics like, you know, having something visual or uh, petitions um, to bring that awareness. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that sounds really, you know, I think it uh, could be potentially challenging for that. But I think one of the questions, too, um, I want to make sure that we have time for folks to ask questions. So just a couple more. But um, do you have challenges around sort of keeping community members engaged in the process? And if so, how do you sort of battle that? Do you, you know, is it, do you have a bench line of sort of, you talked about leadership academies and building leadership. Do you sort of recruit people for those as thinking about a pipeline for leadership for the initiative? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we now have uh, different levels of the leadership academy because we have resident leaders that actually have been involved in our community's transformation even before the initiative started. Um, They're like lifetime um, advocates and fighters in our community. Um, so we've had to build different layers of um, leadership academies and leadership development. But for us, it's been really important that there's ongoing uh, base building, uh, meaning mm -hmm. building new relationships with residents, um, supporting and helping them see how their story connects to the bigger vision that we have for our community and those um, system changes that are needed. So for us, ongoing reach and capacity building is important because we know that residents are going to have ebbs and flows in their lives. There's going to be times when residents might be really active and then something happens in their lives or in their families when they're having to take a break. Um, so that's where having a show of leadership coming in has been really critical and important. Great. So for those of you listening, this is sort of the last question I want to get in before um, we go to turn to the audience. So please keep sending in your questions. Um, so for, I want to give you, ask you to give you some advice for those who are sort of starting out in new initiatives. What are some of the things you would recommend that they think about considering when considering how to embed equity practices in their work? And um, sort of a three part. And if you could go back to your own beginning, what recommendations would you provide for yourself? And also what advice you want to give to folks who are already working, but are really thinking that they need to embed some more equity practices in their work. So, you know, their collective, their collective actions have started moving forward, but they realize that they haven't centered equity or focused them on equity. What would you, what would be some advice you give to folks? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think something that was really, uh, I mentioned it earlier, but I think I, I'm emphasizing it because I do think it was really critical is that from the beginning um, or at strategic points in the life of an initiative, there's very honest conversations about the role of residents. Uh, so it's the intent to engage residents uh, as participants in programs, and that's okay, right? But in terms of having very, very uh, honest conversations so if the intent is to build their leadership, to have them be part of decision-making or uh, higher levels of leadership within uh, the initiative, then there's a set of practices and a set of uh, values that should be developed around how to work with residents. Um, and luckily, there's um, a lot of people that have been doing this work for a while, primarily in the organizing work, where there's tons of tools and resources uh, that I know our team has been able to lean on and leverage. Um, yeah, and then along with having a very clear role from the beginning on the role of residents, then that helps mm -hmm. think about what capacity is needed. I mentioned earlier, uh, ensuring that the basic needs of residents are met, so transportation, translation, childcare, and food. And that might vary depending on community. For example, for us, our community is about 90% Latino. So for us, we're only having to think for the most part, with the exception of a few meetings, translation only between English and Spanish. So knowing your community mm -hmm. and their needs and then building the capacity. So for us, um, because the equity lens and the social justice lens was important, uh, we needed to hire um, staff that understood community organizing principles and who also would be able to connect with residents in a way that was authentic and uh, relatable. I would say those two pieces uh, were really important. 
Um, another advice would be, and a lesson learned from, from us is um, not doing it alone, leveraging the expertise mm -hmm. of all of the different partners, um, whether it be to have um, learning sessions about the root causes for different issues impacting your community. So whether it's having them as guest speakers or having them share curriculum from um, tools and resources that they've already developed. So for us, uh, recently, we've been much more intentional about not recreating the wheel, but really leaning on um, the expertise of our local partners or like-minded national partners who are doing similar work. Great. Thank you. So we have some questions that are coming in, so why don't we get to those? Um, first question, what are some examples of system level or policy changes that have been implemented as a result of your initiative? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say that one of our first campaigns uh, revolved around wellness. So there was a there was a desire in our community to address some major um, gaps in our community in access to health services, health and mental health, mm -hmm. uh, health services, primarily for uh, young boys and men of color, as well as reproductive so services for our young folks. So our residents um, went to visit other communities that had initiatives or had campaigns to address these gaps and decided to advocate for the building of a wellness center in our community. So one of our partners, Inner City Struggle, uh, led a campaign to ensure that the district invested uh, resources to create and build new wellness centers in the community. Uh, Promesa played a big role in that, and then Promesa took the lead in ensuring that out of those funds that our community was selected for one, at least one of the wellness centers that would be built. So it was a very long campaign. It was about three years. But last year, if you go to the, the slide of the We Rallied, We Won, last year we were fortunate and happy to celebrate that the district committed to building a wellness center in our community, a wellness center that would have physical care, uh, care services, mental health services, not just for our youth, but also their families. So it would be open in the evenings and open in the weekends uh, for our communities. And we were able to also secure a health provider that we know also has a very strong social justice lens, and it's going to be mm -hmm. providing services for those populations that often um, don't have access and that we knew from the beginning in our community could not access traditional health centers, for example, undocumented immigrant folks. Great. Thank you. Um, so another question. What is your annual budget for the for, for the backbone organization, and um, where is the funding for the efforts coming coming from? Mm -hmm. So our Promesa budget has grown over the years. Um, we at one point when we transitioned to implementation, uh, it was a, a very bare bone budget of a hundred thousand, and we ha are now mm -hmm. at one point four million, and it supports our community school model and the three schools that I mentioned our early education efforts, which I wasn't able to uh, share in detail, but uh, so in, an initiative to support the leadership of, power, of parents uh, to help their children with child development, and then also our organizing work. And it's a combination, primarily foundations. Um, mm -hmm. It's a combination of foundations and, um, and get, uh, individual giving, but I would say for the most part, foundations. Okay, great. Um, and as a a uh, follow-up sort of related to this is, how are community members incentivized to stay involved? Do you pay your community leaders or your um, people who are on the steering committee or mm -hmm. other leaders? Mm -hmm. So we do not pay residents for their leadership roles, so for, for participation in the General Assembly, in the steering committee, or our Comité de Líderes, which in our Comité mm -hmm. de Líderes, or uh, Leaders Committee, that's where campaigns are identified and selected, and they meet really regularly. So they, there's, residents don't get paid for that because we see it as part of um, the leadership role within their community. But we also mm -hmm. know and that our residents have a lot of needs and often are faced with crises. So what we try to do is ensure that uh, we also mm -hmm. have um, a network of partners that can support our residents in their basic needs. Um, and we also provide uh, 
uh, employment opportunities through other initiatives like Promotora Models, so where residents are out there in the community uh, giving information about access to uh, wellness services and resources in the community. Um, so basically creating opportunities for them to continue to, uh, in a different way, um, use their leadership skills to also give back to, to the community. So for the Promotora work, the, re um, the yeah. resident-led um, information giving and research connector work, those are paid um, positions for residents. Okay. Great. Um, one of the questions that has come across this is that you earlier you mentioned that there are a lot of resources available for how to engage residents. Um, do you have any particular tools that you would recommend for folks on the call? Yeah, I would say that uh, the Midwest Academy is one uh, place where uh, there's some really good uh, organizing uh, resources. There's a, lo a lot of local ones here in LA. Um, and there's also a few, I'm trying to remember if we have them up on our website or if, if it's still in the plans, but we have a few resources on our website. And I can share my email as well if there's folks who are interested in seeing sample curriculum or resources from our leadership academy. We're more than willing to, uh, to share because we, we believe that this work is important. And Great, and so we'll make sure, and you can share it here, and we'll also make sure that when we send out the link for the recording of this, that we share your your contact information so that folks can uh, reach out to you as well. Um, so people have also been very interested in the leadership academies that you mentioned. Could you describe what those look like? Um, you know, what kind of uh, accomplishments do, to, do, do participants, excuse me, um, have to do and go through, sort of what do they achieve? Um, and do you have sort of other different age ranges, young young participants, young kids? How are you sort of parsing that out? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the leadership academies at this moment are only focused on adult residents. We do have a vision and a goal to do uh, to build more leadership opportunities for youth, but we currently don't yet have that capacity. Uh, one of our partners um, is supporting with aspects of that work. But for the resident uh, leadership academies, um, there are different levels, so the basic level includes a lot of relationship building uh, with residents. Mm -hmm. This idea that if people feel connected um, to us and to each other uh, and trust is their commitment over the long term, um, you know, it's going to be felt differently. So there's a lot of time uh, building that community. There's also a lot of time spent um, hearing their stories and mm -hmm. supporting um, their ability to connect their stories to um, the broader issues that are happening in the community and how their stories connect to each other. So they begin to see themes within their stories and the issues that, that we're working to, to address. There's also uh, political education that happens. So understanding systems of oppression, uh, racism, and um, sexism, the isms, basically. Uh, so that there's such language that we use for understanding what do we mean by social injustices? Why, what do we mean by equity? What do we mean by social justice? And then there's also a lot of very individual um, skills building. So whether it is skills building related to public speaking or skills building related to how to do outreach or skills building related to um, the different steps of a campaign and uh, a landscape analysis. And then the third component that we try to embed in all of our uh, academies is the fostering of wellness. So again, it's important that we do what we preach. So if we want wellness in our community, uh, it's been important that we also provide tools for residents to be able to uh, nurture their leadership for the long term. So whether it's inviting uh, practitioners like yoga practitioners, meditation practitioners to come in to the Leadership Academy to share those tools and resources with residents. Great. So I'm going to ask you a little bit about sort of your own personal journey. So you started, you talked about being a community organizer. Would you be willing to sort of share a little bit about your pathway to getting to the role of director uh, for Mesa and just talk about sort of what, you know, your journey and your you know, learning along the way. I think it could be inspirational to some folks who are listening. 
Uh, sure. Uh, so I was born and raised in Mexico City. Uh, my parents immigrated uh, when I was small. So I was basically raised by my grandma. Um, as a teenager, uh, they sent back for us. So I immigrated to the United States um, at the end of middle school. So a lot of the struggles that uh, I see many of our students and their families facing uh, when it comes to uh, arriving to a new country uh, resonate very personally because I also had to struggle in learning a new language, uh, missing my grandma tremendously, uh, rebuilding relationships with my parents, and then building my network of um, support here, especially because we did not have an extended family here. Um, so um, I would say that middle school and high school were very tough. <laughs> I was not a traditional uh, straight-A student, um, but I met folks along the way that uh, felt make me feel safe and helped me see something in myself that I had not yet seen. So I always draw back to that in thinking about uh, how I want students in our community to experience what we do and the work of our uh, so after high school, I uh, unfortunately wasn't able to continue my education because of my immigration status. But year later, years later, I was able to uh, go back to community college, transfer to UCLA, um, go to Harvard, achieve my master's in education policy, and then go back to New York and continue organizing there um, in communities that were facing similar issues to the ones that I faced. Great. Very inspirational. Thank you. Um, so there have been several questions about evaluate, how you evaluate your work. Um, has all your evaluation been in-house or do you have an outside evaluator um, who's assessing sort of to support the work that you're doing in collective impact and see that you're reaching your goals? Mm -hmm. So I would say it's a combination of um, inside and outside evaluators. So early on, we were able to contract with an evaluator that helped us design some basic uh, tools and protocols, and really leverage some of the resources from our national partners. So for us, uh, nationally, the Promise Neighborhood Institute um, supported a lot of our early infrastructure around data and evaluation. Uh, they paid for us to be able to build uh, our efforts to outcomes database, which up until mm -hmm. now has been tremendously helpful. Um, we I would say, though, that data and evaluation is one of those areas that as our work deepens, the need and the capacity has keeps growing, uh, and we have not kept pace with the infrastructure needed to really maximize all of the data and evaluation that we need. So currently, a lot of that work um, ends up being an additional responsibility of our community school coordinators and our organizers um, to really capture the data, analyze it, and uh, share it back with our residents through their individual work or the general assemblies. Great. So um, a follow-up on that. In your evaluation, how do you balance qualitative and quantitative data and information that you collect? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's a good question. I would say that for our school work, for a while, it was very focused on academic data. So we were looking at both end-of-year academic data as well as regular data for all students in our school and really tracking progress made in the key indicators that we selected early on, attendance, um, proficiency in math and English. And I would say about three years ago, we realized that that did not tell the whole story. There was a lot of work that was happening that was not being captured solely by the changes in academic data. So we launched a set of um, additional pre and post surveys um, to track some of that change with a subset of the students that we work with, uh, particularly around social emotional learning. So that's an example of some of the additional tools. With our organizing work, um, a lot of the work is captured through um, a combination of pre and post surveys, but tons of qualitative data. So capturing their stories and how they tell their story over time as well as tracking their level of involvement in the work. Great, so question, how do you share your data? Um, and also, for example, the, you talked about the effort to outcome database. Is that accessible to the public or is that an internal document? And how, do, how are you getting your results out and information out? Is it using technology, word of mouth, meetings? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the efforts to outcome is an internal database, but it does have the ability to produce reports. 
Um, currently, the sharing of data is happening in different spaces. So in the schools, as I mentioned, we have academic and wellness teams, and um, that data is shared um, through those spaces. We also share data as part of our steering committees and our general assemblies. And one of the things that uh, we're working on is making the data much more accessible and engaging uh, because it's been really important that we share that that we share data with residents often, but we also have mm -hmm. heard it's one of the areas where um, it often feels the least exciting. And I think that <laughs> for us, it's that we have a lot of work to do to um, to be able to have the data come alive. Um, other than, you know, residents getting excited that we reached and outpaced the goals that we set in 2010. Um, but for the more nuanced data, yeah, being able to uh, tell it in a much more engaging way. Yeah, I think there are other programs across the country would also be very interested in your data. So just keep that in mind. Um, there's a there's been several questions about the role of schools in your work. Um, can you say a little bit more about how the schools, what strategies they have been using to engage effectively with schools, and sort of what the roles that they play in the work? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's a great question. So originally, we had envisioned working with seven schools. When we had to recalibrate our plan because our funding was different than what we envisioned, uh, we had to begin initially with one school. And we developed a set of criteria for which school we would um, begin our transformation work with. And at the core of that criteria, uh, it really involved having a partnership so that the school did not see us as a service provider it did not see us as a support to the school, but we wanted to select a school that was bought in to the broader community vision, that they saw their school as part of this uh, community movement to transform Boyle Ohio. Uh, so there was a um, an agreement with our first school, Mendes School, that our community school model really would be a partnership in terms of the principal and the assistant principal continuing to participate in the PROMESA steering committee and the general assembly. And then um, on our end, to really leverage all of the academic and wellness partners in the school. And I would say that up until this day, um, there's that commitment and a strong sense of we're doing this transformation work together. And we've replicated um, that same sense of commitment in the other schools that we've expanded since Hollenbeck Middle School and Roosevelt High School. Great, thank you. Um, also, I think people were intrigued by the Early Childhood Initiative. Um, can you say a little bit more about it? You didn't get a chance to expand on it earlier um, and sort of talk a little bit about the that work and then what does the parent component look like around the child development work with your ECE work? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the original vision for our early education work uh, was very broad, very big in terms of we wanted to build new centers, we wanted to work with children, and we wanted to work with parents. And because of, uh, <coughs> one second. <coughs> Sorry about that. Um, because of the us having to recalibrate, we decided to uh, begin where we already have some capacity as a collaborative. So we began by working with parents um, and through a partnership with First 5 LA and uh, Best Start here in LA, we um, launched supports for parents, uh, basically uh, a whole new set of leadership academies that also included, in addition to what I've already shared before, a strong component around understanding uh, child development understanding uh, the importance of building emotional connectedness with your child early on, and then also how to access key services and resources to support their early development. Um, from those academies, uh, we then um, invited some of the graduates to receive additional training and become either peer educators or resource navigators. And they have now reached thousands of other parents with some of the basics um, some basic information um, in our community. Great. Um, and just to follow up thinking about the parents, about how many parents have participated in Leadership Academy so far? For our early education work um, from the Leadership Academy, we've graduated about 250 parents. And mm -hmm. from our 
general organizing work. Um, we now have about 300 participants that have gone through the Leadership Academies. Great. That's great. Um, so we're closing on the end, but it looks like we have one more question in. Um, how have you created, have you created any systems for cross-sectorial partners, service providers to make referrals? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, one component that I didn't mention for our early education work is that we brought together what we called organizational mentors. So organizations that provide key services whether it be uh, physical health services, uh, services related to special education, to meet with our caring leaders and share the resources that they have. They co-developed a resource guide that is the basis of what the resource navigators and peer educators share out in the community. And then in mm -hmm. our school, community school work, we also convene wellness partners. So those are the uh, service providers in our community that um, we are working together to elevate information about the resources that they provide, the requirements, and how to navigate uh, being connected to, to those services. That's great. Um, and it looks like we might have time for one more question before we wrap up. Um, how have you how have you avoided some of the pitfalls that some backbones face as gatekeepers, you know, being sort of the re all resources are funneled through your backbone organization, which could potentially decrease funding for the folks who are part of the collaborative, especially direct services, um, and then centralizing sort of power and decision making. You know, has to, how have you navigated that as um as an organization? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, that's a great question. I think that uh, one thing that feels it is an area that it's an ongoing challenge in terms of we've had several meetings to think together as partners around how to shift the narrative and shift the story with funders around the importance of funding both the individual work and the whole. Uh, so I think we've acknowledged there from the beginning that, um, that we wanted to make sure that we didn't fall into that pitfall of having funders um, hit us against each other. Uh, so we've one success that I would highlight is that there's at least three of our major grants that we've been able to secure as a collaborative, meaning that multiple partners have been uh, built into advanced areas of the work. And that's ongoing work um, that happens. And then we've also been really intentional about not beginning work in an issue area where there's already uh, a depth of expertise um, in the community. So for the most part, because our primary focus is not providing direct services, that but leveraging and connecting and facilitating, uh, but where we do come in to provide targeted services, it's it's where there's a big gap in the community. Great. Um, do you have have you um, just quickly have you worked with the city and or the county in your work, and how have you partnered with them? Mm -hmm. We've partnered with them in targeted initiatives, but it is an area that we wanna we wanna be able to leverage the resources and the supports that they bring to the community so that they are aligned. So I would say that our work with them has very has been very targeted on targeted events, targeted initiatives, or pushing them to expand services and resources. Uh, but we are working to develop much more collaborative um, relationships. Um. Wow, you guys are, there's a lot of questions. I hate to cut them off, but let's, okay, really, literally the last one. Um, in addition to the indicators you use to measure progress on racial equity goals, how do you assess progress related related to racial equity on leadership, policies, and systems change? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we are still developing our organizing measurements. So far, what we track is a number of participants engaged. Um, the level of their leadership, again, through pre and pro uh, surveys, and then on the campaigns that we select. So the four campaigns that we're working on, the first one is immigration, education, wellness, and access to parks and open spaces. Uh, so for all of those, there's key benchmarks that we have uh, as part of the campaign plan. So for example, uh, with the wellness campaign, we won um, that they're going to build a wellness center. The next benchmark is actually it, it having been built. 
But long term, it's not enough to win the campaign. We want to be able to see that the wellness center is utilized and that it's thriving and it's going to be sustainable. So for each campaign, there's goals, uh, multi-year goals to the different phase of the campaign. Great. Thank you so much, Daisy, for taking the time to talk to us and uh, share the work that you're doing. And um, thank you to all the attendees for joining us today and for sharing your questions. If you're interested in finding out more about Promesa Boyle Heights, be sure to check out their website. Um, and you can follow them online at Facebook and Twitter. And as we said earlier, Daisy's willing to share her information with folks. So we'll send that out when we send the link to the recording. Um, in addition, I want to share with you some upcoming learning events, both virtual and in-person, that we are that um, is happening with the Collective Impact Forum. We are continuing the virtual coffee dialogues for um, through September, and we hope you can join us for the next one, which is on August 14th, and we will feature a discussion with the initiative Home for Good on gathering and sharing data. And for those of you who are looking for an in-person experience, we are hosting the workshop Champions for Change, Leading a Backbone Organization for Collective Impact this October 16th through 18th in Los Angeles, California. Champions for Change is our longest running workshop that focuses on supporting backbone organizations, um, leaders and teams. Um, one note you should know about Champions, it usually sells out in advance. So we encourage those who are interested to register soon. Early bird registration ends on August 3rd. So I highly recommend saving your spot when you can also save on registration costs. And again, thank you all for joining us today, and we look forward to chatting with you during our next virtual coffee. Have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you again thank so you. much, Daisy. Take care. Bye-bye.